What? You thought I hated everything? Fuck no. Infinity War opens right after the events of Ragnarok. The Asgardians were funneled onto a transport ship and now that same ship has been torn in half and set alight with Thanos' warcraft looming over it. Heimdall is injured, with corpses littered about him. Thanos' Black Order have swept through half of the ship, leaving very few alive. He then gets to share his perspective. I know what it's like to lose. Feel so desperately that you're right. Yet to fail, nonetheless. He talks about attempting to stop destiny in its arrival, in this case referring to himself. Loki is asked to provide the Tesseract or he will witness the death of Thor. But of course, Loki doesn't care about Thor. He even encourages his death until he starts to hear his brother's screams, and Loki breaks, begging Thanos to stop. Thor admits that the Asgardians don't have the Tesseract regardless. It was lost when Asgard was destroyed, though Loki could not refuse the opportunity for power. The temptation of being something more stems back to the earliest moments in his past. Why have you done this? To prove to father that I am a worthy son. You can't kill an entire race. Why not? And now, it gets Thanos exactly what he wants. Despite the dire situation, Loki is optimistic, and Thanos tries to comment on how misplaced that is, only to hear Loki's reasoning. We have the Hulk. <laughs> Echoing Stark from so long ago. The Hulk then bursts onto the scene and begins to assault Thanos, landing several hits and getting him into a corner, only for Thanos to turn the fight with just a selection of well-placed counters. He knocks the Hulk to the ground, beaten, bloodied, and unconscious, a position graver than we've ever seen the Incredible Hulk. Thanos is extremely powerful. He is extremely dangerous. Heimdall then grips his sword and channels dark magic in a last-ditch effort to save Banner with the Bifrost and send him back to Earth. As a result, Thanos then executes him much to Thor's dismay. Thanos then adds the Space Stone to his gauntlet alongside the Power Stone that he acquired from Xandar, and his Black Order are sent to find the two stones on Earth while he finds the two that remain on other planets. As of this information, Loki offers his services to act as a guide through Earth, but Thanos claims his experience is failure. In response, Loki attempts to share his achievements, claiming his rightful kingship of Jotunheim, his position as Prince of Asgard, the God of Mischief and his title as Odin's son, with a look to his brother, remembering who he is. Loki lunges at Thanos, but the gauntlet prevents him from landing the strike. As a result, Loki has the life choked out of him by Thanos. The camera slowly pans to a broken Thor lying atop Loki's corpse. The two had their differences, but in the latest iteration they actually managed to find some peace. But now he's gone. Thor has now lost every family member, half of what remained of his people and his best friend, only to be abandoned on his ship as it's blown to hell. Thanos just beat the Incredible Hulk in one-on-one -on -one combat. He strangled the main villain of the Avengers. He has a gauntlet with the might of space and power, and he decimated the Asgardian people. The game has changed. We then see the Hulk has been transported directly to Kamataj, much to the surprise of Wong and Doctor Strange, who are now a part of a bigger world. Heimdall likely sent Banner here because he is of Earth, and Kamataj is a refuge, a place with enough power to disrupt even a god. I have been falling for 30 minutes! Bruce then warns the Doctor that Thanos is coming. We then see Tony telling Pepper that he had a dream where they had a kid together, and his life with her was moving forward, but he woke up to realize that it was all taken away. They've planned a date for their marriage, but Pepper's worried about Tony's decision to keep a new unit so close to the chest. Tony says it's simply protection, not like before. The consistent struggle between Pepper and Tony is his attachment to being a hero. Many times he doesn't have to be the one that protects the world. It can even be a detriment. Yet he will always feel that he has to be, and he will often choose that over his life with her. So Tony says, no more surprises and that should be a promise. But before he can make it, they are interrupted by a portal with Doctor Strange exiting. He wants Tony's help in saving the universe. Before Tony can make sense of the situation, he is reunited with Bruce Banner, an old friend that Tony has been without since the events of Age of Ultron. Wong then explains that when the universe was created, six elemental stones that each controlled an essential aspect of existence were created, with Thanos looking to combine them all. Banner explains that Thanos is behind the attack on New York, and he is coming here himself only for Tony to say, 
This is it. This is the end game for the Avengers. This will be their greatest challenge. This is what drives them to Tony's nightmare in Age of Ultron, knowing what is to come for his people after the road he's led them down. Tony suggests destroying the Time Stone, and Strange says that they have not only taken an oath to defend the stone with their lives, but that it might be an effective weapon against Thanos, which leads them to butt heads quite significantly. You seriously just say hitherto undreamt of? You seriously leaning on the cauldron of the cosmos? <laughs> I'm going to allow that. Tony Stark and Stephen Strange are both very much egocentric characters, sure of their own perspective and happy as the top protector of Earth, so watching them clash is exactly as satisfying as you would imagine. They decide to try and find Vision, as he is the Mind Stone, and Tony says that Steve Rogers might be able to help. Bruce is almost confused at the idea that they can't simply contact Steve, and Tony shares with him that they've been through a breakup. A lot has happened since Banner has been gone. They fell out hard and it's tough to open a dialogue. But as if to reaffirm the idea that logic is forgotten when it comes to the heart, Banner reminds Tony that Thor is gone, and who Tony is or isn't talking to doesn't matter when the universe is at stake. But before Tony can complete a call to Steve, with the phone he gave him two years ago, something arrives just outside. Wong, Doctor Strange, Banner and Tony make their way through a panicking city and see the arrival of two members of the Black Order. Meanwhile, Peter Parker notices the descending ship and suits up for the coming fight. And we get two fantastic lines, one where Peter asks Ned to cause a distraction so he can get into the fight, and immediately Ned Ned simply does this. We're all gonna die! <laughs> That's just fantastic. On top of that, the two members of the Black Order arrive, with the telekinetic making an announcement that Earth should rejoice, only for Tony to cut him off and Doctor Strange to add a threat. You're trespassing in this city and on this planet. <laughs> Get lost, Squidward. That's just fantastic. Bruce then attempts to bring out the Hulk, but he can't, no matter how hard he tries, and Tony says something else. Dude, you're embarrassing me in front of the wizards. That's just a fantastic comedic line on its own, but it's another insight into how much Tony wants to perform in front of these new powerful beings, to show that there is a reason that he and his team were the protectors of Earth before Strange even began fighting. That, combined with the idea that he actually doesn't take these enemies that seriously, is convinced that he can just knock them out. But the final layer being that it's a tongue-in-cheek reference to the meta of how ridiculous it is that they are grounded comic book heroes in this realistic world despite their nonsensical abilities and circumstances. Okay, look, the city is flying. We're fighting an army of robots. And I have a bow and arrow. None of this makes sense. The Russos clearly showing that they are once again fantastic at understanding these characters while injecting some hard-hitting comedy. Iron Man then suits up with nanotechnology, allowing him to regenerate his suit over time if it's lost and spawn weaponry at hand. This gives him a great advantage compared to his past suits. He even blasts away what is essentially the equivalent of Evil Hulk with relative ease. Doctor Strange, realizing the Hulk isn't going to arrive, then portals Banner out of the fight. Soon after, Iron Man, Wong, and Doctor Strange all engage the two members of the Black Order. Iron Man is squared away with Evil Hulk while Strange fights Squidward. Spider-Man then prevents Iron Man from getting smashed into the ground and begins fighting alongside him. As a form of update on what's happening, Iron Man sums up the situation for Peter as this. Uh, he's from space. He came here to steal a necklace from a wizard. Ah, <sighs> brilliant. Doctor Strange then attempts to use the Time Stone to win the battle against Squidward, but his hands are bound before he can finish the spell. Yet he is very confident because of the dead man's lock he's got placed on the eye of Agamotto. This means it'll be locked to anyone attempting to open it, especially if they kill Strange. He was likely casting that when they began this fight, and so Squidward opts to make Strange unconscious instead and captures him while Spider-Man tries to prevent it. Iron Man then makes his way to the Space Donut, where Spider-Man has already tried to keep up with Doctor Strange and he's losing his ability to breathe. As Spider-Man falls, he is picked up by Iron Man's own upgraded Iron Spider design we saw back in Homecoming. Then he is promptly sent home. Tony doesn't want Peter in danger. Arriving on the ship and calming down the situation, Tony gets a call from Pepper telling him to come back, telling him he shouldn't be on the ship. Tony apologizes, but he has the knowledge, the power, and the will to act. He doesn't have a choice. Banner then decides to put a call into Steve with the same phone he saw earlier, and Rubber Band Man begins to play, leading the scene transition to the entry into the Avengers for the Guardians of the Galaxy. They're getting along as any dysfunctional family can do, responding to a distress signal and sharing banter in between. Quill even comments on potentially stealing the distress ship after Drax suggests it, and that motivates Rocket for the mission, but Quill immediately backtracks on that line the moment Gamora acknowledges it, showing a great back and forth between all of them, including 
including a now teenage Groot playing Defender on a portable console. It is unbelievable that the writers have a strong understanding of so many different characters from so many established stories of their own with their own styles, taking advantage of every last piece of dialogue. It shouldn't be possible, yet here we are. Peter Quill tells them to put on their mean faces as they arrive at the aftermath of the Asgardian massacre, the distress signal originated from here. Soon after, Thor slams right into their ship. Drax can't help but refer to Thor as what seems to be an angel having made a baby with a pirate, and I can't help but appreciate how goddamn good the dialogue is. You join Earth's mightiest heroes. Not today, sir. Are you making your voice deeper? No. Mantis then peers into Thor's mind, saying he is feeling grief, sorrow, anxiety, anger, and guilt. Once Thor has been provided a blanket and some food, he then lets the Guardians know what has happened. Gamora then provides an explanation. Thanos wipes out half the population of any collection of humanity he finds to maintain a balance that can sustain the resources for far longer, something he did to Drax's people and many others. He now hopes to do it on a universal scale. Thor is then convinced that there is only one place he can go to craft a weapon powerful enough to kill the Mad Titan. Therefore, he will need the help of the Guardians to go to Nidavellir and craft a weapon in the same foundry that Mjolnir was created. The Guardians decide to split up. Thor takes what he refers to as Rabbit and Tree while the rest go to nowhere in order to cut off Thanos from collecting another stone. We then cut to Scotland and we can see that Scarlet Witch is trying to test living a life with Vision. After much of what they've both been through, it's time for peace, to explore what they feel, try to make something normal out of the chaos they both sprang from. Over the two years, it would seem that they have grown quite close. Vision's Mind Stone is causing him great discomfort and he says it's as if he can communicate with it. He asks Wanda to interact with the stone and she says all she can feel is him. We then see they are making their way to the train station as Wanda wants to leave. They have both made promises to other people. Vision then struggles to say that he wants Wanda to stay and that they work, their relationship works, only to be interrupted by a report that Tony Stark is missing and an alien ship invaded New York. This prompts Vision to leave, but both he and Wanda are taken off guard by the two remaining members of the Black Order. One looks like a goblin from Lord of the Rings, maybe. The other looks like an enemy from a PS2, well, PS3, PS4 game. Vision is impaled by the alien spear and is now unable to phase, but Wanda rescues him from the removal of his stone. She spends much of the fight protecting him from the adversaries despite his protests, and goes to show just how powerful she has become, especially when motivated by love. Vision asks her to leave, but she remains resolute in taking on both members of the Black Order, though she doesn't have to be alone as the other Avengers enter the scene. Cap, Falcon, and Black Widow all assault the two until they flee to their donut, and we get to see a thankful Vision saved by Steve, despite the last encounter they had. This is once again developing that now is the time for a united front. The smaller issues have to be put aside. The next scene shows us what it's like to be in a massacre ordered by Thanos. In this flashback, we see Gamora's homeworld being assaulted by an army of Chitari, slaughtering the fleeing civilians, tearing apart a planet, while the Black Order act as soldiers and spokesmen for the will of Thanos. A young Gamora shows ferocity while being pushed to a large group of soon-to-be-executed civilians, and Thanos picks her out, offering to help her. He shows her what looks like a toy, and yet can seals a knife, perhaps an allegory for how fast she lost her childhood to become an assassin under Thanos. Thanos tells her that balance is important. If there is too much on one side, then it fails. At the same time, Gamora's people are executed in the background, making a very clear point about how he views his actions. Thanos turns her head and so begins their father-daughter relationship. This is treated as a memory Gamora is concerned about and she warns Quill that they will meet Thanos eventually, no matter what, and if she's captured by him, Peter needs to kill her to stop Thanos from getting information he needs. At first, Peter doesn't take her seriously, but then she begins to shed a tear and asks that he swear on his mother, an extremely important detail. And so Peter agrees. Quill, Drax, Mantis, and Gamora then make it to nowhere, and Quill commands them all to perform certain moves but is ignored, with a neat detail of Mantis actually walking along like a praying mantis. They overhear Thanos attempting to get the Reality Stone from the Collector, and Drax begins to slip into a rage, seeing the man responsible for so much death on his home planet, and he prepares to attack him just like he did with Ronan. You killed my wife. You killed my daughter. Of course, Ronan was only a puppet. It's really Thanos I need to kill. Peter explains that they don't see the stone, and if they get it first, they can stop Thanos. And despite that being true, Drax cannot contain his heart and ignores Quill. 
something that might be very relevant later. Mantis puts Drax to sleep, and the thud of his body alerts Thanos to their arrival. Gamora then takes point and outmaneuvers Thanos until giving him a strike to the neck with a sword and a strike to the heart with a knife from the flashback. As Thanos falls to the ground, he simply asks why. Why would his daughter do this? And Gamora can only lose herself in pain, watching what she knows is a creature she may have actually loved in some way bleed out, calling for her. Thanos then reveals that he was using the Reality Stone to manipulate the very world around them, revealing that nowhere has been set aflame and that he's not in fact dead. Thanos was waiting for Gamora to arrive, as he wanted what information she has, alongside the fact that he wanted an answer for whether or not she actually cared about him, as he does her. At that moment, Drax charges Thanos, only to have the Reality manipulated once again and he's turned to rubble, alongside Mantis being turned into ribbons, leaving Quill to stand off with Thanos and his captured Gamora. Quill is torn at the prospect of killing the woman he has come to love, but she reaffirms that he promised. Quill is reduced to a threadbare realization that he has to kill her, and so he pulls the trigger. Thanos reduces Peter's blast to bubbles with the reality stone at the moment he pulls the trigger, and lets Quill know that he actually really likes him. This entire time, Thanos was simply curious if he would come through to do what was needed. It was a test. With that, Thanos leaves with his captive through a portal and the Guardians recover from the reality shift. We then see Rhodey discussing the aftermath of Civil War with Ross, stating that the criminals he once captured are only labelled that way because of Ross placing that label on them. Rhodey even cites the events of Civil War being the reason for Vision's disappearance, his conflict. Ross counters with the fact that Rhodes is one of the many who signed the Accords, and Rhodes makes it clear that he has paid his dues for that. After the accident, I doubt he feels like defending the Accords all that much, but he has gotten some use of his legs back with the same style of tech we saw in Civil War. Ross then says the world is on fire, but that doesn't change what happened in Civil War. These people are still criminals and they are still under arrest. Rhodes then cuts the call with Ross and has chosen to fight outside of the law with Cap to defend the world. This completes a significant arc for a small character. Rhodes used to force the law on heroes under the jurisdiction of the government, a government he believed in. Now that world is at stake and the government still wants to imprison the world's heroes when they are trying to save it because they won't work for them. Rhodes has now lost his faith and will fight with the heroes instead. Bruce Banner then slowly enters the room and it falls silent, except for him and Nat saying each other's names. The last they saw each other wasn't easy and I'm sure she holds some form of a grudge, as does he. Falcon then cuts through the tension with a comment on just how awkward it all is, but there isn't time to discuss it. The team talk about the current situation, they talk about Ant-Man and Hawkeye having to take care of their families after the Accords, so they struck deals with the government. With this information, Banner has to ask a rather simple question. There's an Ant-Man and a Spider-Man? Banner wasn't here for either of their introductions, so it's a logical statement for him to make, and it's funny because it's true. Banner then explains that Thanos commands destructive armies and he will assault Earth until he gets the stone from Vision. Black Widow demands that they protect it, but Vision counters and says they must destroy it. He suggests that Scarlet Witch's power, being that of the stone, can overload it if she simply focuses enough, breaking it down and thus preventing Thanos from using it. Wanda says that Vision would die without the stone, and they are not going to have that conversation, whether or not he is requesting that she be the one to kill him. Steve then says that they will not exchange lives, ever which is very much in line with his idea of valuing the individual far before anything else. But as Vision points out, Cap sacrificed himself to save everyone within a radius, and Vision suggests he'd die for the universe. Before Cap can answer him, Banner suggests removing the stone from Vision to then destroy it. There is one place that is a secret to Secretary Ross, a place with the technology to pull this off, and a place where they would have the knowledge to do it. Wakanda. The film then takes us there and we see that Winter Soldier has entered the game with a brand new vibranium arm to boot. Back at the donut, we see that Doctor Strange is being tortured by Squidward, demanding the stone to be released in preparation for the arrival at Titan. Iron Man then spots Doctor Strange's cape is still here, hoping to save him, and on top of that drops in Spider-Man, much to Tony's dismay. They exchange words on top of each other again and again, with Spider-Man actually blaming Tony for making the suit so good that it allowed Spider-Man to be here, which he immediately takes back and says plainly, there is no way that he can defend his home if there is no home to defend finalizing his decision, but Tony makes it very clear he didn't want him here because it is likely a one-way ticket. Peter then concocts a plan in reference to the film Aliens when Ripley blows the Xenomorph Queen out of the airlock. We see Iron Man blow Squidward out into space just as well. 
With Spider-Man rescuing Strange and the whole sealed, the mission is complete. And mere seconds later we find that Doctor Strange is not thankful for being saved and neither is Tony forthcoming about being right, about his lack of definitive protection of the stone above all else. The two characters clash heavily, almost coming to blows because of how utterly narcissistic both of them are. They are the smartest guy in the room, and they both have the power to act on it. Strange wants to return home at the very least, getting the stone as far away from Thanos as possible, while Stark wants to take the fight to Thanos considering the destruction it brings to fight him on their own turf, and they won't be expected. They both exchange their perspectives about the other failing to understand the situation, and it ends with Strange making it very clear that he will absolutely allow Peter and Tony to die before allowing the stone to fall to Thanos. Tony then provides Peter with an arbitrary knighting, telling him he is now an Avenger. Despite it being so comical in nature, with Tony finding it to be a chore, Tom Holland sells Peter's appreciation for joining the team. You can tell it's a dream come true for Spider-Man. Back on his ship, Thanos has brought Gamora food, sharing that he knows she hates the room, the throne, and her life with him, yet he wanted her to secede him. He wanted her to feel like family. He saved her from death to become something important, the fiercest woman in the galaxy. Gamora shares that her people were happy before he arrived. As a counter, Thanos tells her about her planet now compared to back then. It was filled with starvation and misery but now it is reborn with happiness and the planet is thriving. The deaths of half the population was a worthy price to pay for salvation. Resources are finite in the universe and thus reducing life before it completely spills over is the only way to create a lasting paradise for the living. To which he is cut off by Gamora speaking for the audience by saying that Thanos cannot know that that is the definitive solution to the universal planet-wide misery and that ultimately he is insane. He looks genuinely frustrated with her, as if he knows why she feels like that, but he can't explain the logic well enough. So Thanos shrugs it off and says not only is he the only one who knows that it's true, he also is the only one who has the power and will to act on it. So Thanos gets to his point and asks Gamora for the Soul Stone. She initially refuses to provide Thanos any information, lying about her lack of knowledge, but once she hears the desperate screams of pain from her sister at the hand of Thanos, she caves in and tells him what planet the Soul Stone is on, and Thanos demands that she show him. It doesn't matter what's at stake. When your family is threatened, you'll do everything to protect them. And that's who these people are. I don't need you always trying to beat me. I'm not the one that just flew across the universe just because I wanted to win. You were the one who wanted to win, and I just wanted a sister! We then cut to Thor explaining the plan to the rabbit, that he'll go to the birthplace of Mjolnir and create a new weapon with the forge powered by a neutron star. But he goes quiet once the hammer is mentioned, likely bringing up a past that Thor has yet to really deal with. So Rocket wrestles with the idea of talking him through it, after establishing that every member of Thor's family has now been killed alongside his friends and home. He begins to break, but resolves to declare that he is strongly motivated to find vengeance. He is certain that fate will deliver Thanos' death to him, and he is asked what he'll do if he's wrong. What more could I lose? I can't get over how much Thor has become a genuinely human character after one rather large retcon. The writing done to make him not only grounded, but strong and sympathetic echoes right on through this film, with Chris Hemsworth doing a fantastic job bringing it to life. The scene then moves on to the rabbit explaining an eye he stole after winning a bet, which leads him to providing Thor with a replacement. As much as it's a great moment to show that Rocket is bonding with Thor, it's more of a strong callback to the kleptomania that Rocket engages in, as well as his fascination with body parts. Oh, I was just kidding about the leg. I just need these two things. What? No, I, th I thought it'd be funny. Was it funny? There's one more thing we need to complete the plan. That guy's eye. Oh, I'll get that out. Thor thanks the sweet rabbit and they make their way to the foundry, only to meet Tyrion, who apparently works there. 300 dwarves were wiped out by Thanos after Tyrion had created his gauntlet under threat. Tyrion was spared for his creation, but his hands were sealed shut. Though with help from Thor, Rabbit, and Tree, he is certain they can create a weapon that will stop Thanos. We see that Iron Man, Doctor Strange, and Spider-Man have arrived at Titan. Meanwhile, Nebula has escaped and begins to head to Titan as well, after being repaired by a Chitari. Iron Man then thanks Strange Strange for helping landing the craft, and Spider-Man warns that there's something coming. Quill, Drax, and Mantis then begin an assault
result in the characters clash in what is extremely satisfying combat, countering strong heroes with weaker ones because of reasonable technology. They then end up in a standoff and Quill threatens to kill Peter. At the thought alone, Tony then threatens to blow off Drax's head if he even tries. Once they're able to calm down, Quill demands to know where is Gamora. Confused, Iron Man says he can do one better. Who is Gamora? And then... Do you want better? Why is Gamora? And the entire cinema, myself included, lost the collective shit at that line. Drax, never fucking change, mate. It's just a metaphor, dude. His people are completely literal. Metaphors are gonna go over his head. Nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. I would catch it. Die, spaceship! <laughs> They eventually work out their confusion, lay down their arms, and begin to plan their attack on Thanos. This scene has a massive amount of conflict between two very much alpha characters trying to figure out how they can communicate rather than what their plan is. This plan of yours, I think it's good, except it sucks. So let me do the plan, and that way it might be really good. Wow. This references to classic films that both Peters would share for different reasons, Tony getting utterly frustrated by the fact that some of them don't even know the definition of words he is using, and all of it is shunted by Doctor Strange revealing that he has been peering into the future, and there is only one outcome of over 14 million that results in their victory. We then see Thanos has made it to the planet that houses the Undiscovered Stone, which simultaneously acts as the home of Red Skull, a man consumed by the search for power is now cursed to guide others to a power he can no longer possess. Red Skull explains that the Soul Stone is not to be passed around like the others, there is a certain requirement to it. You must understand the gravity of the situation and sacrifice something dear in exchange for it. A soul for a soul, in order to understand just what you're trying to achieve. This amuses Gamora because she knows that Thanos loves nothing. His killing, torture and conquest is halted by the universe itself. Thanos cannot win. She then realizes that he is shedding a tear, because there is something in the world that he loves. Thanos has already realized that to achieve his goal, he has to kill Gamora, his daughter. He finally had her back by his side, but even now, the thing that he values so much can't get in the way of his new goal. Thanos remarks that he ignored his destiny once, but never again. Gamora even tries to kill herself, but his reality stone won't allow it. Gamora is then thrown from the precipice, and in exchange for her death, Thanos receives the Soul Stone. We then see Cap and his side of the Avengers have made it to Wakanda. Bucky joins them, and they get Vision to Q. She says that it is possible to remove Vision's stone, but it'll take time, and immediately following that, Thanos' army begin to invade. Thor and Rabbit then start up the foundry in order to melt the materials required for the weapon, but the main door allowing the light through needs to be held open by someone. Thor decides to do it himself, taking the full brunt of the star. He manages to barely survive, and once the hammer has been given its handle, the magical weapon Stormbreaker is created. We then see Thanos' army launch upon Wakanda and everyone begins to shape up, Banner operating Veronica and blasting with both arms, Falcon sweeping the battlefield alongside Rhodey, Cap, Black Panther, Michonne and Nat are all preparing for the assault with an army of Wakandans, using the spears to fire bolts of energy. Almost as if the Russo brothers watched my Black Panther rage and retconned the spears into rifles because that makes sense. Who's primitive now, Michonne? The grunts start to circle the dome, and out of worry for them being able to break in behind, Black Panther opens the gate at the front so they have a way in and begin to flood instead of going around the sides. The armies engage, and we see a full charge led by both the American and Wakandan super soldiers. As they progress, the swarm begins to overrun them all, and right as hope seems lost, Thor enters the battlefield and smashes down a huge blow of lightning with his hammer, bringing in both Rabbit and Tree to turn the tide of the war. We then cut back to Titan and Thanos has arrived. He discusses the history of the planet with Doctor Strange, remarking upon how this was his homeworld. It was once beautiful, but like all planets it had too many mouths to feed, losing its resources to a detrimental level. Thanos offered a solution, a culling of 50% of the population at random, dispassionate. Fair. No difference between the rich and poor alike. He was labelled a madman, yet what he predicted came to pass. Doctor Strange assesses that perspective as the desire to commit genocide with a wanton need for ending trillions of people's lives. But Thanos counters with the simple fact that once he has the six stones, he can end those lives in an instant with a snap of his fingers. That would be mercy. After that, he can look out onto a sunset, rest, and appreciate that he was the only one that could have done this, and he did it well. The hardest choices require the hardest wills. 
to which Doctor Strange engages a battle. We see Iron Man drop a massive ton of rock on top of Thanos while launching a constant barrage. Spider-Man firing web with a collection of kicks and punches, Drax getting slashes on Thanos' legs and Quill firing shots throughout the fight, with Doctor Strange supporting them all with shields, portals and platforms. Before Thanos can make a full sense of the situation, Nebula bursts onto the scene, ramming him into the ground with an escape pod, immediately demanding to know where Gamora is, and he is caught off guard. Each of the team begin to subdue him in their own way, Peter stunning him, Spider-Man webbing him, Drax holding his legs down, Mantis attempting to make him sleep, Doctor Strange bringing everything he's got around and on top of him, and Thanos is neutralized, but resisting the entanglement. Quill then takes the opportunity to get close and demand Gamora, to which Thanos immediately responds, my Gamora. Quill, angered by the thought of her imprisonment again, asks where she has gone, and Nebula quickly figures it out. Thanos went to retrieve the stone with her, and she didn't return. Before Quill even realizes what Nebula is saying, Tony begins to beg him to stop and think, to not react. This is the most important moment of his life, and he has to think clearly. Tony recognizes the same fury that's about to take Peter that took him so long ago. The vengeance that might be righteous, but it's a spiral of suffering. The kind that doesn't allow logic to come into question. Quill demands to know if it's true, and Thanos says he had to. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Lost, helpless, and enraged for killing her. Quill attacks Thanos, causing Mantis to lose control, resulting in each of the heroes losing their holds on him. Thanos then quickly knocks out Quill, Drax, and Nebula, with Spider-Man attempting to collect them all up before they hit the ground. Thanos reveals Doctor Strange to be carrying an Eye of Agamotto with nothing inside. He knocks him clean out leaving Iron Man as the last hero to stand in his way. Then, Tony opens with the displeasure of having a moon thrown at him, only to hear Thanos call his name. You know me? I do. You're not the only one cursed with knowledge. Which is a fantastic piece of dialogue, and we'll get to it. Iron Man gives out everything. Missiles, blasts, shields, lasers, clamps, stuns, rams, and punches, only to be beaten again and again, until his armor begins to shed all over, losing more and more pieces to drop more and more blood on the battlefield. Tony moves a large portion of the nanometal to create a spear and misses Thanos, resulting in it being broken off, reversed, and used to impale him through the chest. As Tony whimpers his lasting breaths, Thanos says he respects him and hopes that he will be remembered by what remains of humanity once he is done. But before he can deliver a killing blow to Iron Man, Doctor Strange bargains for his life in exchange for the Time Stone. Thanos agrees and leaves with the stone before anyone else can stop him. All that's left is for Tony to ask Strange why he would do something like that. We're in the endgame now. Thanos' army then engage a huge set of underground grinders to assault our heroes, and Scarlet Witch comes in to protect them, leaving Vision to be attacked by the Goblin. Banner then brings in Veronica to defend him and almost dies as the Hulk still refuses to help out, but with quick thinking, he attaches the removed arm to Evil Hulk and sends him right into the Wakandan Dome to be obliterated. Vision is then impaled again, leaving him weaker than ever, and he's told that he is no formidable machine. He is dying just like any other man. Only for Steve to come in and prevent the killing blow. Meanwhile, Scarlet Witch, Scarlet Johansson, and Scarlet Michonne all converge on the PS3 boss and toss her into one of the diggers, splattering her for good. Cut back to Cap, who is losing the fight with the goblin, but while being strangled, Vision saves him. Cap says he told him to run, and Vision replies, We don't trade lives, Cap. Brilliant callback. Thor begins to mop up all of the ships as they flee the area, with the remaining heroes being called in to protect Vision from Thanos. As if with ease, Thanos slides through the Avengers, sealing them in the environment or simply blasting them away. Wanda then listens to Vision beg her to kill him, to save the world. He says she's the only one who can. It's not fair, but she can't hurt him. He will only feel her. Calling back to the earliest scene in the film. And so Wanda begins to overload the stone, losing any sense of composure as she watches all of the Avengers fail to even slow down Thanos, ending with Steve, the first and last Avenger being knocked to the ground. Vision then says, I love you, as he is broken into pieces, the stone along with him. Though Thanos isn't remotely concerned, as he can now reverse time just as Doctor Strange did, reforming Vision along with his Mind Stone. Batting away Wanda, Thanos then reaches into Vision's skull and pulls the stone from him killing him again. Thanos is then at the point of achieving all six, the might of mind, soul, reality, time, space, and power together. After a surge of light, he is ready to click his finger. 
Thor then arrives and his weapon manages to resist the power of the completed gauntlet, throwing his axe to embed it deep into Thanos' chest. Despite that achievement and the revenge served by a long-awaiting Asgardian, Thanos still performs his task and thus begins the end for half of the world. He then escapes into a portal of his making. Once he is left, our remaining heroes begin to realize what has happened. Captain Steve Rogers watches his 100-year-old friend, he defended to the death, shatter into ash right in front of him. T'Challa finds his personal bodyguard, Okoye, telling her that she needs to get up. This is no place to die, only to fade right in front of her to ash. Groot is taken in front of Rocket. Soldiers surrounding the battlefield are almost swallowed by this plague. Wanda watches herself fall apart just before Falcon sees the same. Back on Titan, Tony watches as Mantis begins to fall away, followed by Drax and Quill. Confused, he turns to Doctor Strange, only for him to say, there was no other way. Moments before turning to Ash along with them. And then, a confused, scared, and desperate Peter Parker begs for help from Tony. He feels unwell, and Tony tells him he's going to be okay. He says he's sorry, and falls away from Tony's arms. Tony is left to realize that his worst nightmare has come true. All of the work he committed to has fallen to ruin. The film ends with a limping Thanos reaching the sunset he wanted once his task was complete. A fulfilled man, looking out satisfied over a job well done. And that was Avengers Infinity War, and what an incredible fucking film it was. This is the first part of what commemorates ten years since Iron Man hit the theatres, and such an insane amount of work has been completed since then. This film is packed with so much care for a franchise of characters and storytelling that it's unbelievable we're in a timeline that we got to see it. We have Fallout from Civil War, direct continuity with Ragnarok, a glorious, suitable introduction for the Guardians as they join the Avengers, Spider-Man, Strange, and Black Panther all serving character-driven roles, protecting the people they've sworn to serve, and our core team from back in Joss Whedon's spectacle kicking just as much ass. Details like Doctor Strange's surgery scars are still visible, Rhodey is still injured, Ant-Man and Hawkeye actually have reasons to not show up, Thor arrived late to Thanos because he didn't have a transceiver, the film makes an effort to show each of the heroes using them except him, Rocket comedically sharing that he still has a lot to lose compared to Thor, and he loses all of it by the end. Tony keeps the phone that Steve gave him on him at all times, he is desperate to speak to his friend, but he knows he can't. Not to mention that once Iron Man is reported missing, Steve says that Earth is in trouble as it's lost its greatest hero. The details of these two are fantastic and they don't even share a fucking scene. Strange actively providing the stone despite the strict assessment that it's the last thing he would do, telling the audience that this is a part of the plan, especially considering that his last line was that it's the only way. The world was set, the characters arrived and suffered to a new villain only to blast expectations to smithereens, so why does it work. Thor, since Ragnarok has been dealing with a set of heavy losses and now that he is at his wit's end, watching his people, his best friend and his brother die at the hands of a horrifying, cruel monster, he is given his target as well as his opportunity to hunt them down with all of his might. After acknowledging it all, trying to accept it all, he almost dies to craft a weapon that can give him an opportunity to take his vengeance, and he gets it. We got to see him crack down a battlefield with all the might of Asgard behind him. He got to plow that axe deep into Thanos' chest and listen to the mad titan wince in pain. He may not have killed Thanos, but Thor received power, control, and retribution for so many losses that he's suffered over the series. Speaking of Thanos, what a way to say fuck you to the detractors claiming that Thanos will be a letdown of a villain. You put the fucking work in, didn't you? Thanos' opening, killing the god of mischief and beating the Hulk in one-on-one -on -one combat, sets the stakes strong from the get-go. You don't want to fuck around with this guy. But the little details are what make him so much more human than many of the characters in superhero films these days. Do you please? Thanos is absolutely consistent on his ideology, killing only by what he defines as his design or when people stand in its way. He actively explores other characters, pursuing weaknesses in Quill, testing logic in Doctor Strange, respecting the ingenuity and perseverance of Tony, and discovering if Gamora still loved him. You need to note that Thanos never lays a hand on Gamora. He tries to feed her, comfort her, explain why he is doing what he is doing. And after she said she hated to see the throne, he takes a seat on the steps instead. He even has Nebula reassembled. He doesn't need to do any of these things, but he does them anyway. It shows that Thanos loved Gamora. He cared about her almost as much as his entire life's purpose. 
It is something of a tragedy for Gamora to gloat that her father will suffer because he is nothing more than a monster, only for her to realize that she now has to die because someone loves her. Once Thanos has achieved his goal, he admits he had to lose everything, but he couldn't allow history to repeat itself. His planet was destroyed by overpopulation, and the idea of killing 50% of the living creatures is not a button anyone can push, no matter how right. So he identifies himself as the one with the will to do it. Through that, he has camaraderie with Stark. The curse of knowledge, the power to act on it, and the will to commit. It consumes you. You become a pawn to your own ambition. Thanos had to do it. It will create the most salvation throughout the universe, more so than anything else would. He felt desperately that he was right, and nothing was going to make him fail this time. For the greater good, he would even sacrifice his own beloved daughter. Despite these humanizing qualities, these weaknesses and motivations, he is still to be feared, cosmically. This creature kills if he needs to. Iron Man with his greatest technology was nothing more than a pinprick. From his perspective, Thanos is the protagonist, the hero. He will save the universe no matter what these beings do to him, no matter how they attempt to lead this world to destruction. You can argue against him as much as you want with whatever logic you think applies, but Thanos will always look at you as a child who lacks the life experience necessary to understand why this is the only logical course of action for the benefit of the living. Thanos has loved and lost like everyone else, but now he has found a way to create the most mercy in the universe universe. People won't understand it. People won't like it. Nevertheless, he will make the decision for them instead of waiting for them to reach the point of no return only to realize he was right all along. Thanos is one of the best realized villains across the MCU, if not the best. Being Gamora's father allowed the writers to inject him into an emotionally important role at the same time as making him definitive in his motivation. And that connection he has to Gamora is only rivaled by Quill. From the moment he met Gamora, he has been enamored with her in his own way. After protecting her and subsequently almost dying for her, he spends moments breaking her walls down, dancing with her, completely falling in love, all of it leading to her being what is not only a partner but something to live for when Quill has been faced with losing both of his parents and the man who raised him. Quill is an inherently emotional, irrational man, oftentimes jumping to an outlandish choice down to a singular piece of information. It broke my heart to put that tumor in her head. What? No, no, all right. I know that sounds bad. Who in the hell do you think you are? You killed my mother! And despite everything he's been through, he still had her. They were close enough for her to ask him to swear on his mother that he would end her life to protect her from Thanos. That is a heavy request made out of love, and when he gets the first chance of being able to rescue her from Thanos, it's all torn away. She's already dead. She can't be dead. The fury takes over, costing him more than he will ever know. Stark was lucky that Steve was able to stop him from crossing the line, but nobody could stop Peter. Not when it was her. We were finally given time to see Vision and Wanda get their brief moments of peace together, sharing a connection from being the outsiders of the Avengers. From the day he saved her to his admittance of attraction, Vision has spent his time trying to be a hero like those who created him, trying to come to a conclusion about his own life, his purpose. He wants to fight to preserve life, he wants to help his friends, and he wants to do it with Wanda, the woman he loves. They begin softly, sharing their connection unrestrained, only for Vision to suffer for every scene thereafter, becoming weaker and weaker, being impaled, blasted, and driven into the ground, getting himself in more and more trouble by trying to defend others. He decides to do the most mortal thing there is die to prevent the most suffering to ever threaten the universe like a hero and the only person who has the power to do it is the one that he loves elizabeth olsen has what i can only describe as an incredible performance selling the idea that she is killing the only person who made her feel normal again while he tells her he loves her and to watch the horror on both of them as it's reversed to have Vision's very soul torn from his body. What makes him so close to human, what brought him to the gods that created him, is pulled out, leaving behind a cold shell sapped of its color. All that's left is the machine. It's horrific. The powerful, intelligent, and heroic Vision dies as a man. 
but perhaps the most impactful moment goes to a particularly powerful road being drawn to its close. Tony Stark has been through a lot in his series of films, finding that he must balance his urge to protect Earth while living the life of a man. Well, what if I didn't? If you didn't? Yes. You mean when you finished? Leading him to protect his power, nuke his power, automate his power, submit his power, and finally, to keep it as insurance, to maintain a safety net if ever he or his loved ones were attacked, but never in pursuit. Once he knows that this coming attack is what he's been waiting for for six years, what sent him into anxiety attacks, what has consumed him since he saw his vision, he fights it to the point of leaving Earth's solar system and to the realization that Pepper, the person he loves the most, will never come between him and his will to prevent the suffering on a universal scale. This is very much the reflection of Thanos himself. With all that happening, it's tough to realize that Tony has also dealt with the fact that his dad didn't love him as much as his work, his mother, or himself. Hell, he loved Cap more. Tony then sees the tape in Iron Man 2 that tells him his dad considered him his greatest achievement and his work was all intended to be left to him. His dad absolutely loved him. Tony couldn't share any real moments of closure or love with his father despite his desperation because they were killed by Hydra in an attempt to steal his formula. This destroyed what made Tony so callous as a man in the first place. He needed to reevaluate the man he'd become. Moving on to Civil War, he treats Peter as his surrogate son, brings him in only to tell him to leave the second he is visibly hurt. Tony is looking to ignite that lost flame to get that relationship he's pined for his whole life, taking a positive step in that direction. In Homecoming, he keeps him in what is essentially a box. Despite Spider-Man's raw strength, he only wants him fighting low-life criminals because it's safe, and he's a child. Mr. Parker. Got a sec? Uh, I'm actually at school. No, you're not. Nice work in DC. My dad never really gave me a lot of support, and I'm just trying to uh, break the cycle of shame. Uh, I'm kind of in the middle of something right Don't now. Don't cut me off when I'm complimenting you. Great things are about to happen. What is that? Uh, I'm at band practice. That's odd. Happy told me you quit band six weeks ago. When Peter succeeds, he congratulates him, shares with him that he always wanted this kind of relationship with his father, that he's proud of what he's doing. But then, to subvert Tony's security, he lies while trying to get involved in something Tony told him to stay away from. Peter wanted to go behind Tony's back and avoid what was essentially his protection, his care. I tell you to stay away from this. Instead, you hacked a multi-million dollar suit so you could sneak around behind my back doing the one thing I told you not to do. Those weapons were out there, and I tried to tell you about it, but you didn't listen. None of this would have happened if you had just listened to me. You know that I was the only one who believed in you? Everyone else said I was crazy to recruit a 14-year-old kid. He was furious, and he took the gear back. Peter didn't deserve to have it if he wanted to thrill-seek. But Peter saves the day and Iron Man's actual equipment from Vulture without a suit and reasserting that he only wants to do good. Lying was the way that he saw an opportunity for it, and that's why he did it. Peter is reinstated and their relationship is strong once again. In Infinity War, he decides to help because he can. Despite Iron Man's attempt to stop him, he even goes on what can be assumed as a one-way trip because he wants to help people. What if somebody had died tonight? Different story, right? Because that's on you. And if you died... I feel like that's on me. I don't need that on my conscience. Tony wants him gone because the last thing he can bear is watching the kid get hurt. And so, echoing the dream he has in the opening about a child with a woman he loves called Morgan taken away in a moment, Tony has to watch as Peter is slowly turned to ash in his arms, begging to stay with him. All in a handful of seconds, Tony loses one of his Avengers. He sees an innocent boy trying to save lives perish. But most importantly, he has that new and loving fatherly connection severed again, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. But it falls on him. Everything falls on Tony Stark's conscience as he was alive to stop it and he couldn't. Tony now loses the son he never had, the team he built to protect the world and the universe itself. Nothing he could build or prepare could prevent it. After six years of it festering in his head, his nightmare has broken through. Tony is frozen, unable to emote. He couldn't accept it before, and now it's real. Everything has fallen apart. This is it. Pair all of this with Tom Holland's heart-wrenching performance selling a Peter Parker that has begun to feel death coming after watching all the people he just saved turn to ash. I don't feel so good. You're alright. I don't, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Sir, please. Please, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. He begs Tony not to let him go again and again while failing to stand, fading away in his arms. 
The scene was incredible. The film itself was a culmination of many running stories and characters dealing with very human grief and disturbing events, reaching conclusions simultaneously that could rival any kind of television series finale, covering strong patterns of family, love, sacrifice, and death. Characters giving in to the destruction of the universe to save the suffering of their brothers or sisters, families coming to save the day only to be torn to shreds, many characters having to sacrifice what they have come to love for the greater good and the death, the rampant, cold death of so many beloved characters. The credits of this film play like an obituary, the audience was dead silent, a respectful end to a defeating story that still has more to come. This began with Iron Man, but the original Avengers revealed the potential of this series. Those Avengers are a large portion of what remains for the heroes, each dealing with their own issues while being set up to save the day, to pass over the Marvel mantle to the new heroes that have been lost. This isn't just a celebration of one film and its achievement to bring together so many other properties with weight behind them. This is a celebration of what has been accomplished with 10 years of character writing. 10 years of trying to create something that people could become enamored with. This spans completely different personality types, completely different plots, completely different settings, completely different worlds. Directors having their style blasted through with writing having space and quality to shine. Incredible performances combined with special effects to support this comic book world's realism. All of this took talent, time, effort, and passion. Marvel should be fucking proud of themselves. Drama and comedy are a tough balance, but throughout Marvel's series they have shown they're going to shift it in one way or the other, with Infinity War being no exception. This is not an entirely morbid affair, and it does benefit from that. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh. Using your made-up names, then I am Spider-Man. You said we are going to open Wakanda to the rest of the world. This is not what I imagined. What did you imagine? The Olympics, maybe even a Starbucks. Cool. So cool. We have Rabbit, Tree, Squidward, Blanket of Death, Kick Names, and Take Ass. I am Steve Rogers, the baby of a pirate and an angel. What was she doing up there the whole time? I'm gonna blow that nutsack of a chin right off. And who could forget? Motherfucker! This film was an event, a triumph. Each of the crew and cast involved deserve a pat on the back for bringing a 10-year path to an incredible peak. I can't even tell you about all of the amazing details this film has, aside from what I've already discussed, nor will I share any flaws. I don't know if you noticed, but this assessment is extremely biased in one specific direction to complement my other recent work. Infinity War was a fucking fantastic film, and the Russo brothers prove once again that they know how to write a villain. They know how to juggle extremely large, important, and controversial elements. How is this dude still alive? He is not a dude. You're a dude. This, this is a man. A handsome, muscular man. I'm muscular. <laughs> they understand the characters they are tasked to write for, but most importantly, they respect them. Giving the MCU fans the explosions, powers, and escapism we all look for with an added sense of reality to hit us right in the heart. To make us feel for the fiction. Because in a dreary world, beacons of hope and justice can offer some real comfort. Beings with absolute power choosing to help others is endearing and inspiring. Marvel Studios have achieved something incredible, unprecedented, setting a record in more ways than one. As a fan, I couldn't be more impressed with the task they had and the product they created. Thank you for making something so fucking awesome. And thank you all for watching my video. I can't wait to cover the sequel. Normally I do videos where I simply talk about the negatives of a film in a quick rant. I decided to try and do the reverse with this one. Let me know if you liked it and if you'd like to see more. I know a lot of people prefer the vitriolic hatreds to let's say, appreciation. So again, thank you for checking out my content, folks, and I will see you next time.